Welcome to our weekly briefing brought to you by the Emergency Leadership Team. I'm Ruth Jackson in Academic Affairs, and I'm joined by my colleagues and fellow members of the Executive Policy Group, Mrs. Teresa Powell, Office of the President, Dean Joshua Busby, Student Affairs, Dean Joshua Snavely, School of Business, and Chief Mario Holland, LUPD. In today's webinar, we will begin as we always do with our COVID-19 status update. We'll also provide a recap of our students' return to campus. We'll have a continued discussion of our move-in protocols and we'll share our process for students requesting remote instruction. And as always, we'll end by reflecting on resilience. At this point, I will ask Chief Holland to provide our COVID-19 updates. Chief. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, and welcome everyone. I'd like to provide the COVID-19 update um, as of noon today. Um, for the state of Oklahoma, the total cases had a weekly increase of 5.1%. The total number of active cases in the state of Oklahoma is at 11.5% of a weekly increase. And the unfortunate number um, of deaths in the state of Oklahoma had a weekly increase of 9.9%. For Logan County, uh, the total number of cases is at 1.9%. And the total active cases for the county had an increase of 19%. And an unfortunate uh, for the deaths in Logan County is at 23. For the total number of cases for the university is 90. And for the number of active cases um, for the university is at 10. Uh, one thing that we have seen is um, there is a slight plateau um, as far as with the COVID cases. And hopefully we will get to a point with vaccinations uh, starting in the state. Um, hopefully we will see a decrease. And now with that, I will pass it to Dean Snavely. Thanks, Chief. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Wanted to start today giving a brief overview of our students' return to the campus over the last uh, 10 days to two weeks. It's been a busy time for them and for us in the emergency leadership team, and we're proud to report uh, the numbers and some of the, the updates here. So. During the, the move-in period to date, we've screened close to 1,500 students and guests for um, any number of health different pieces to their return. As a part of that, as we shared last week, we have begun a partnership with uh, an, Oklahoma, an Oklahoma company named Total Wellness. And Total Wellness helped us to administer during that time frame nearly 1,000 COVID tests on students and student athletes who are returning to campus and campus activities. Uh, in that time period, we're, we're proud to report that as a result of our protocols, we only saw eight positive cases as a result of the pre-arrival test and the arrival test that uh, Dean Busby and Mrs. Powell will talk a little bit more about here in just a minute. Um, we, we had less than 1% um, positivity rate through this process. Um, we're happy to report that all of those students who did test positive are doing well, uh, that they're experiencing relatively moderate cases to mild. Um, and through a partnership with uh, a local hotel, we were able to keep those eight cases off the campus. Uh, so our, our hope here is to create a bit of a bubble like we've seen in some other contexts uh, as we return to to keep both our students our, and our employees safe. And we believe that our adherence to these really robust protocols has led to really great uh, results, um, relatively speaking, as we work through a pandemic. So those will continue. We'll talk more about those in just a second. We've got a couple of pictures here to show you from that process. Uh, this is an image of the testing that was occurring on Historic Cottage Row. Uh, it was all drive-through testing that occurred before the students were uh, allowed to return to campus housing and given wristbands and cleared through the process. We also 
had some of our softball players uh, consent to let us take their picture as they got um, that friendly prick in the nose by that long um, Q-tip that I, I know all of our colleagues here have experienced several times over the last couple of weeks. We, we went on a pace of every other day, essentially, to make sure we were um, healthy ourselves, but also showing the students that we were willing to participate in the protocols. So uh, overall, the process went extremely well, extremely efficiently. We're so grateful to the students uh, who were willing to follow this process and it's led to a healthy and safe campus as we begin. And so I'll turn it over to Dean Busby to talk about how we're gonna continue that process as we have students continue to return to campus. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. And so uh, as Dean has stated, I uh, want to definitely uh, thank our uh, colleagues in residential life and housing services, as well as all of the volunteers uh, for helping, because uh, we could not have done it without you uh, January 15th through the 20th in facilitating uh, the move in for our, for our students. And so I uh, just wanted to say thank you uh, and lead with, with, with my appreciation to you. I do want to let you know that uh, we've gotten, I'd say probably about 85 to 90% uh, of our students moved into housing. There have been some students that have uh, communicated to us that they wanted to check in a little later uh, than, than that, that time frame that we had allocated that we had been communicating since uh, the, uh, the, towards the end of the fall semester. Uh, we do want to let you know that residential life and housing services will continue to accept students for check-in through February 3rd. So that's through the end of the drop and add period. Uh, uh, so again, February 3rd will be the last day uh, that we will allow students to move in uh, on campus. Uh, all new residents uh, who are not currently on campus who are looking to move into campus will have to adhere to the, to the following test, uh, testing related procedures and protocols which have already been in place. We're gonna continue that. Uh, and we'll talk more about these uh, uh, in depth on the following slides, but I just want to quickly highlight what those are. Uh, the first one uh, is that uh, every student has to submit a pre-arrival test with negative results. Uh, of course, what we're asking is if uh, uh, we need at least for that to be submitted at least 48 hours prior to your arrival. Uh, so if you're planning to move in on February 3rd, the deadline would be February 1st at the absolute latest uh, for us to receive that pre-arrival test. Uh, it would need to uh, be emailed to l-u-e-l-t at langston.edu. Uh, secondly, there will be a arrival test once the student arrives on campus uh, and prior to them checking into housing to receive their key, they will be administered a second test from uh, our partners uh, in total wellness. Uh, and then third, uh, once they have been on campus uh, for a, a certain amount of time, they will be administered a third post-arrival test uh, uh, of course, and of course, all of these test results have to be negative. I didn't state that, but all of these uh, uh, tests have to be negative. If they're not, uh, then uh, the student will receive further guidance uh, from uh, the emergency leadership team. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Powell, who will talk uh, uh, more in depth about the pre-arrival COVID test requirement. Thank you, Dean Busby, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank all of our returning students for their participation and adherence to this requirement. Overwhelmingly, our students did exactly um, as we asked. They complied with this requirement and ensured that they provided our um, emergency leadership team with their pre-arrival test results timely and they followed all the protocols that we asked and that helped us have a very safe return to campus. So first I wanna thank everyone for, for doing that and making our jobs uh, so much easier by giving us exactly what we needed in that. The pre-arrival test, um, I know we got some questions about this. It may have seemed to some as though it was unnecessary or redundant, but it really became a critical component of the multi-layered approach to mitigating the risk of COVID-19. And the reason is because it gives our emergency leadership team a number of data points in knowing where our students are with their health and wellness as they prepare to return to campus. So we asked our students to submit their required pre-arrival test to us via email. They did that. 
by and large, um, some students were surprised when they received a positive result. Uh, so they sent that to us as well. And we, of course, um, worked with those students to accommodate. Some were early on enough. They got their test on January 6th. They were positive on January 6th. They were able to complete their quarantine and move in before the full move in uh, process had ended. So they had a very seamless process in which they could complete their move into campus. We had some other students who unfortunately were positive as well and maybe got those results a little bit later and we were able to work with them to accommodate remote instruction as needed. So we're working with them and we'll help them move back onto campus when they are feeling well and healthy and after they have finished their quarantine period. So again, this was just another layer to that approach in the protocols that the emergency leadership team established to ensure that students returning to our on-campus resident facilities were doing so without any detection of the virus. And it worked very, very well. So we're very proud of these protocols. For those students who are returning for late arrival, as Dean Busby said, we do have a February 1st deadline to receive those pre-arrival tests. We would like to receive a test that was administered within one week of February 1st. So that means clocks are ticking. Uh, February 1st is one week from today. So if you're planning to move in, um, you may wanna make arrangements to get that test relatively soon. Some clinics will give you same day results. Some clinics take a few days. So please be sure to act quickly if you plan to have a late arrival for move in so that you can have your test results submitted to us at l-u-e-l-t at langston.edu. I do want to say um, those of us that manage that email, uh, it got to be a little overwhelming at times. So uh, thank you to our, st our students for being patient. Um, that's why we're requesting this 48 hour time frame so that we can ensure that we're verifying your results adequately and that we're responding to you. So wanna also thank, say thank you there. In submitting those results, it's important that your results come to us from a medical provider. It can be a, a screenshot of your app. We had lots of ways where we were accepting those results. Um, some students submitted a screenshot of the app on their phone that included the result. Some students were sending us a photo um, or a screenshot of the printed document that they got from their provider or perhaps a screenshot of their email. We will accept whatever you can share um, that will remain confidential within the emergency leadership team. We just need it to include your name as the patient, the date that your test was administered. Sometimes this is shown as the collection date and also uh, the result, which needs to demonstrate no presence of the virus or it needs to clearly state negative. So those are the three components that we're looking for in this pre-arrival test. So again, it can be a screenshot, it can be an attachment in a PDF file um, and email that to l-u-e-l-t at langston.edu. Again, 48 hours prior to your arrival. So if you're coming on February 3rd, we'd like to receive that from you by 11.59 p.m. on February 1st. And we appreciate everyone's adherence to that. And now I'm going to ask Dean Snavely to share more about our arrival test. Thanks, Mrs. Powell, and thanks to you for all of your efforts on uh, monitoring that, being the primary person to monitor those emails. Um, and it, it is it was quite overwhelming and uh, quite a quite a task. Uh, just like we've done over the last several weeks, um, the uh, we will continue that arrival test um, with our total wellness partner. Slightly different now based on the fact that we are back in school and we have less volunteers uh, and less staff to, to accomplish um, this uh, you know, goal. So as you can see here, we will accept um, students through housing and it's really need to coordinate. If you're a student planning to return in, from now until February 3rd, you need to be in close contact with the housing folks uh, our testing time frame for for those students is 2:30 to 5:30 on on weekdays, um, as identified in that Calendly system. Uh, so reach out to LU Housing to facilitate that appointment, and then we'll be conducting all of the testing over this uh, next two week period uh, in the multi. Students should go to housing first, 
um, and then they'll be directed to the multi after they've checked in uh, with their housing teams. And we continue to use uh, the Binax Now test, rapid test from Abbott Labs, um, and have been in close partnership with Total Wellness and Abbott as we've utilized those tests. Thought it was important that we you know, have these third party relationships to ensure the credibility and the integrity of this process. And that has worked well and to our advantage uh, as we've worked to create this mitigated and safe environment. So Dean Busby, you wanna talk about the post-arrival test process for folks who are already on the campus. Absolutely. Uh, and so for our uh, students who are on campus, as we talked about, uh, this is the third test uh, that they would, uh, that they are going to be administered. Uh, and so, uh, after arriving on the campus, of course, all residents uh, were advised that they would uh, have to secure an additional negative COVID-19 test prior to Monday, uh, February 1st. Of course, a great thing about this through partnerships uh, with the institution uh, that uh, these tests are being administered free of charge uh, to our students, the, the second and third test. So the arrival to campus test as well as the uh, post arrival test is being administered uh, free of charge to the student. Of course, as Mrs. Powell stated, that that first test could have been, uh, uh, you know, could have been free or, or utilized or obtained through uh, insurance, but uh, this is no additional cost to the student. Uh, and so all post arriving tests, uh, testing for our students that are currently residing in housing uh, on campus will occur uh, beginning this Friday in the multi, uh, January, Friday, January 29th. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and we'll do that on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So from Friday the 29th to Sunday the 31st from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily in the multi, uh, we will be uh, offering those post-arrival tests uh, for our students who are currently residing uh, in housing. Uh, to make an appointment and because we, we don't want everybody to flood to the multi, we are asking all of our students to make appointments uh, and so students should follow the link that will be sent out in an official uh, email that, that will go out later this week uh, with additional guidance and instruction uh, there. And so again, this is the third of the requirements uh, that was required for our students who are currently uh, residing and who plan to reside on campus. Uh, and so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chief, uh, who will talk about an additional opportunity uh, for our faculty and staff. Thank you, Dean. So as far as for testing for LU uh, employees, um, this week, employees are encouraged to utilize the complimentary uh, testing service uh, through total wellness to mitigate risk of COVID-19. And for the opportunity to do so, the days are Monday uh, to, through Thursday from 2.30 to 5.30 p.m. And the location is uh, in the multi. And there's no uh, appointments necessary uh, for this week, but um, to get tested um, Monday through Friday from 2.30 to 5.30 in the multi um, is the important days and times and locations to remember. And now with that, I will pass it back to Mrs. Powell to let you know of more testing protocols. Thank you, Chief. So if you are able to visit us in the multi this week, or if you came um, last week when we offered this testing, we have set up a process for everyone to follow. This has worked very well with our students. We um, had a, a great number of students come through this process last week as well. And we have set up a process to get everyone in and, and have it flow pretty seamlessly. So when you walk into the multi, the first stop will be these tables that you see in the first photo. You will complete a HIPAA release form that just allows us to have your test results on file um, and to give those back to you. The university will, of course, give you your results directly. You will then uh, follow the stanchions down to the end of the multi. You will come back up a line and form a socially distanced queue, if you will. And you will go to the desk, which is pictured there in the middle photo. That's the sign-in desk. And our partners at Total Wellness have made available a sign-in sheet that helps them keep track of who they're testing. You'll simply sign in to that sign-in sheet with your name. And you will then go have a seat in the distance chairs that you see in the third photo. 
our partners at Total Wellness will then call your name when it's ready for you. They are ready for you rather to come have your test administered. And it's just a very quick test. Those of you who have done it with us, it's 15, 20 minute wait. You will have your test performed. You will go back and have a seat in the multi and then you will be called up again when your results are ready. So it's a pretty simple uh, process and it's worked very well. We have, uh, I think that we've kind of worked the kinks out now. We've, we've gone through this process a few times and, and we've had a higher volume now with our students. So we've added some more tables, we've added some more seating and um, hope that it works to meet everyone's expectations and, and get everyone tested that, that wishes to have that testing completed this week. And now I will ask uh, Dr. Jackson to give us some more information on our next topic, which is requesting remote instruction. Dr. Jackson. Thank you. So we'll pivot a little bit and uh, as Mrs. Powell mentioned, talk about our re remote instruction option. The first thing I'd like to say is, is to really stress that the university uh, has placed a priority on safety. We've provided PPE, the testing protocols that uh, my colleagues have just outlined. Uh, we're maintaining our social distance. All of these things are in place across our university and all of our campus spaces with safety in mind. So our goal is to have an increased offering of in-person experiences this semester but again, with safety in mind. The way that will look in most classes is small rotating groups, depending on the size of the classroom and the identified uh, COVID-19 capacity. So each instructor will work through the class roster to determine what those rotations look like. However, for students who uh, have underlying health conditions, perhaps, uh, care for someone with underlying health conditions, we have provided the option to request remote instruction. Again, we want to encourage students whenever possible to remain on campus and to engage uh, in our campus community, but we understand that there are some personal circumstances. So in order to request the remote instruction, uh, the best place to go is to our D2L global news feed. You should have access to that through all classes. Uh, in the global news feed, you'll see a link, a form that uh, you'll complete, that students are required to complete in order to make this request. In order to have the request even considered, the students have to understand that there are certain conditions that they are required to adhere to. For instance, if the class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 o'clock, then the student should be available um, with cameras on if that is the directive of the instructors at 10 o'clock. Cannot double dip and schedule work hours uh, during, during uh, class time. So on the form, there are a number of conditions that students have to agree to. That also includes having the appropriate technology to support remote learning. Another important factor is that we're asking that if remote instruction is requested, that it's requested for all classes. Uh, you may remember we've gone over this several times in various forms, but we have the different course modalities, flex, web, and hybrid. Classes that are designated as hybrid courses are listed that way for a specific reason. And that is usually because the course requires the use of specific equipment or materials or um, because the student has to demonstrate mastery of an objective in person. So if a student requests remote instruction, it's important to note whether there is hybrid, a hybrid course listed because that may require some additional um, requirements of the student. In addition to those agreement statements, students have to provide a justification of the request. Uh, and that justification will likely have to do with medical health and underlying other medical underlying conditions. Uh, one thing of note 
if a student finds that the circumstances change, perhaps the person is no longer living with someone who um, falls in one of the vulnerable categories, the student can make the request to return to in-person. Our goal is not to have students jumping from one modality to the other, but we want students to be able to um, make a shift if they realize that this is not the right modality for them and if their conditions change. All of these requests will be reviewed by the Office of Academic Affairs. The deadline to submit the requests is next Tuesday, February 2nd, and students and instructors will be notified no later than February 5th of the decision. Again, it's also the student's responsibility to notify instructors or to communicate with instructors once the decision has been made. So two layers to make sure everyone is on the same page. I'd also like to review a couple of uh, upcoming dates. Uh, class has started on Thursday. I've heard great things about the first two days of class. Um, the add drop period for classes that are in the first eight weeks, uh, that add drop period ends on Wednesday of this week, January 27th. Uh, as you know, by now, we are having remote instruction from now through the end of this week, basically building upon that bubble uh, that my colleagues talked about earlier but in-person rotating groups in most instances, depending on the enrollment, will begin on Monday, February 1st, so a week from today. As I just mentioned on the prior slide, February 2nd is the deadline to request remote instruction, and February 3rd is the end of the add drop period for full semester or 16 week classes. As a reminder, our midterm examination period runs from March 11th through the 17th, and our modified spring semester break will be on March 18th and 19th, a Thursday and Friday, and on these days, the university will be closed. So at this point, we'll pause and open the floor for any questions that you may have. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or in our question and answer. Okay, so we have one question. Um, in terms of uh, requesting remote instruction, would financial issues be a rationale? So thank you for that question. Generally, the rationale is based on health conditions, underlying health concerns as outlined by the CDC. However, there is a space on the form for students to indicate if there is another uh, reason that they would like considered. And that may require some conversation and communication from my office to the student, but most of the requests will be based on health. Thank you for that. Can we have a question uh, about sanitizing? Can we get the disinfecting spray bottles refilled in the lecture halls? Absolutely, so absolutely. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Jackson, but but ab absolutely. Thank you for that question. We will uh, reach out to our colleagues in uh, Sodexo to make sure that they're going uh, around to uh, assess and to refill and, and refurbish and replenish any of the stock and supply that we may need. Thank you, Dean. We have another question about um, instructors. While instructing after the 1st of February, uh, can students and instructors cover their faces? Uh, absolutely. 
we are still adhering to our, um, our plan, our Protect the Pride plan. Face coverings are still required in um, indoor spaces and encouraged across the campus. Uh, we, the EPG and the ELT have uh, been delivering PPE equipment for faculty, which includes uh, face shields and um, disposable um, masks. And that is in addition to the branded LU masks that were available through student and employee services. So not only can you, that's the expectation that we will adhere to face coverings uh, in the classes. So thank you for that question. So I don't see any other questions. And so uh, we'll move on to reflecting on resilience. One of our favorite parts of our weekly webinar gives us an opportunity to highlight, thank and commend our campus community for uh, keeping us safe and, and uh, during these difficult times. So what you'll see in the next few slides are pictures of our volunteers volunteers from across the campus who gave of their weekends and their evenings to assist with what has been a very different move-in process. So as always, thanks to our colleagues in residential life who are always on and, and making it smooth for our students to return. But this time, we just wanna say a special thanks. It's no way that we can name everyone but I'm just proud of the fact that we had volunteers from across the campus. In this picture, you'll see um, uh, Dr. Nisa, uh, let's see, our nursing students, we'll see our coaches, Dean Peterson, Professor Thompson. We have volunteers from, as I said, everywhere, the Office of the President, Academic Affairs, CTI, sponsored programs. Special thanks to A.D. Rogers and the Department of Athletics. As always, Dean Busby and Student Affairs. Uh, our, our academic deans really, really uh, showed up. So special thanks to Dr. Peterson and Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Hunter, the faculty and our student nurses from the School of Nursing and Health Professions. Dr. Patterson Harris and faculty from School of Education and Behavioral Sciences. Dean Simpson, Dr. Simpson and our colleagues from the university libraries, faculty from the School of Agriculture and Applied Sciences, our School of Business, admissions. All of these people took the time to show up and welcome our students back with safety, first and foremost in mind. And I would be remiss if I didn't also thank our colleagues who were not physically on campus, but certainly tuned in virtually to make sure that our students who showed up had access to enrollment management, financial aid, um, admissions, student and employee services. Special thanks to uh, our advisors in University College as well as our faculty advisors. So. Thank you, Mrs. McGill, Dr. Johnson, Mrs. Buckley, and, and everyone who took the time to volunteer. It really makes a difference when families and students see our faces uh, outside of class, letting them know that we're, we're happy to see them back and we're doing so in a safe manner. So I'm sure there'll be other opportunities, hopefully not in a COVID environment, but <laughs> There'll be other opportunities, so please heed the call when volunteers are requested. Um, please make some time. It, we, while it was cold, we had a lot of fun as well. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. Our next session will be next Monday, February 1st at 1230, our new time. And the topic of that webinar will be technology. So thank you for joining us. Have a great week and until next time, take care Lions.